This is the Inner the Buzz podcast, helping smart businesses be even more innovative. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Anovabiz. Welcome to episode number 93 of the Innova Buzz podcast, designed to help smart businesses with an interest in innovation become even more innovative. In this episode, my guest is Mike Morrison of the Member Site Academy and host of the Membership Guys podcast. Mike talked to us about the secrets of running successful membership sites, about engaging an audience and building a community. We also talk about the importance of content marketing in building up your audience and ways to get new clients while retaining the old ones. Mike was very generous in sharing all the secrets to running a successful membership site and membership business, so there's a lot to learn here, whether you're running or thinking of running a membership program, or if you just want to consolidate your relationship with your customers. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Mike Morrison. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to have with me today on this episode of the InnovaBuzz podcast from Newcastle in the UK, Mike Morrison of the Membership Guys, so half of the Membership Guys I believe and also from the Member Site Academy. Now, Mike's previously run his own digital agency with a very high profile list of clients And these days he hosts the Membership Guys podcast and he helps clients achieve fantastic results from membership sites. So I'm really excited to explore that in some detail. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Mike. Jürgen, thank you so much for having me on. What a great intro. It's a great privilege to have you here as our guest today. Now, Chris Ma suggested we get you on the podcast, so big hello to Chris if he's listening. We like Chris. (laughs) So do I. He's uh, great value. All right. Now, as I said, I'm really looking forward to our chat today and I'm keen to explore some of the secrets of running a successful membership site. But before we get on to talking membership sites and marketing membership sites and entrepreneurship and innovation and that kind of stuff, let's find out a little bit more about you as a person and your journey. What what did you want to be when you were a young kid? Ah, I want to be a lot of things. The one that sticks <laughs> up my brain uh, is a is a computer engineer and programmer. Actually, okay. actually, hold up. The first thing I wanted to be was president until <laughs> um, until my mum told me that they don't actually have presidents in the UK. In the, yeah, but yeah, but um, yeah, I, I I don't know what it was. I think my my aunt gave me a hand me down Commodore VIC twenty computer old school computer and she told me that's what I was going to be when I grew up a computer programmer and engineer so I listened I was about five years old I think <laughs> um, so that changed quite a bit over the years but it, not too far away from what I ended up doing mm. so did you go into programming and computing no no, no. <laughs> I didn't I remember um, the old Commodores used to come with this gigantic doorstop of a of a manual and uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in there it had kind of a step-by-step guide on how to write your first program and it was kind of a, a an algebra uh, program that would solve algebra problems like the most basic algebra and it took me like four or five weeks again I was very young um, but it took me four or five weeks to write what now would probably take me maybe 10 minutes uh, but that was enough to put me off and it's not really uh, I don't know what it's what, what it's like where you are or in other parts of the world but especially at that period of time uh, there was nothing um, throughout school or throughout college that uh, that kind of provide a pathway for anything other than figuring out how to use Microsoft Word so uh, no it was never anything that I, I kind of seriously pursued and uh, even when I did start uh, learning programming and web design development uh, further on in the future, uh, it was never something I even conceived as a career path or something that people actually did for money. It was always kind of just a, a hobby. I'm a bit of a geek, and so it was it was something that just uh, kept me occupied for a few hours. And it took a little while for that penny to drop that it was actually a valuable skill set. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, I remember um, my first computer was a Sinclair ZX81. And nice. Oh, that's that's the enemy, Sinclair, <laughs> Commodore. Right. Yeah, that, exactly. Wow. 
<laughs> and I think I got that before the Commodore actually came out, so they might have been first Sinclair. And I remember I don't know that. trying to hack uh, into databases and, and <laughs> trying to, as a young guy, trying to um, get these programs to work that you actually had to pay for, and we didn't, yeah. didn't have the money to pay for them. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think trying writing my first algebra uh, program and waiting for Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, the game, <laughs> yeah. to load up are are kind of some of the most prominent memories of my my computer using childhood. Okay, so how did you get into the web design and the digital marketing area then? Um, it was kind of I don't want to say I stumbled into it, but I guess I kind of did. Uh, we we very first got the internet at a college um, when I was 17, I think. So this was uh, back in like 99, 2000. And I didn't have it at home. We got the internet installed uh, at school. Just so happened to be uh, in the period of the year where you're kind of freed up for self-study for exams. So we had a lot of a lot of unmonitored time at school and I, I got hooked into into this online thing. So, you know, when while my friends were were using it to torment middle aged single women in chat rooms, <laughs> I was I was off using Yahoo GeoCities to build uh, my very first website, and uh, the first website I ever built was a gaming review website. Again, I'm I'm a geek. I love my video games, and uh, yeah. I, built this website i would write up reviews i had a, a amazon affiliate link that took people off to to buy the games i was reviewing and uh shortly after setting it up and convincing the school administrator to set my website as the home page of all computers in the school <laughs> uh, i made my first few dollars online and that kind of hooked me in but uh, it was always a hobby it was never something even though i was making money from it it was never something that I thought was anything other than something you did on the side. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a career path. You know, the education and the career path here uh, was very much laid out as you go to school, you get good grades, you go to college, you get good grades, you go to university, and you come out of university and you get a good job. And a good job is in accounting or law or finance or something like that. So my serious life, the real life was going down that path. Mm. The, the hobby stuff and the stuff I do to um, to wind down was building websites, developing online communities. I ran a whole bunch of those uh, in the early 2000s, again, generally centered around gaming, online gaming, stuff like that. Um, and I was building up little software businesses. I was flipping websites, but it was all for pocket money. And yeah. uh, it wasn't until probably around 2004, 2005 that I realized you know, I've developed quite a skill set, not just in terms of the building of the websites, because once I'd started making a little money from those, that's when I really got interested in not just the tech side of how to make them work, but more importantly, how to actually you know, market a website and build a business around a website mm. and uh, you know, how to tie the sales and marketing stuff I was doing in my career into the the tech and the design stuff that I was doing as a hobby. Mm. So that's when it came together and you went out on your own? Uh, yeah, it was around about, you know, I, I was getting people asking me to build uh, websites for them around from around about 2003, 2004. Uh, and, you know, I, again, I take those on just as a side thing. It was a nice way of supplementing what I was earning through, through my career. Um, but, yeah, it was, I think it was around 2006, uh, to end of 2006, early 2007, where um, I, I was kind of like, okay, this this needs to become a full time thing. I, I'd kind of been essentially been a freelancer for a couple of years before that, and uh, so yeah, I left left my job um, unceremoniously and went out on my own, setting up a, a digital marketing agency about 10, 11 years ago, and yeah, it, that's kind of where I've been since. Mm. And when did you kind of move away from client project work to a full-time business running membership sites and training? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, with the agency, just as the years went on, uh, we, we just kind of kept narrowing our focus, narrowing our focus on the types of businesses we most enjoyed and mm. got the best results for, for clients. You know, we were 
keen to scratch our rich as well as play to our strengths. And those happen to be membership sites, e-learning, online communities. So about five or six years ago, I joined forces with my significant other, Miss Callie Willows. Uh, she is the other half. Many would say the better half of <laughs> the membership guys. And initially, we went into business on the agency. And it was probably about a year or so later that we made that decision to work exclusively on membership projects. And you know that's what we, we did for a couple of years. It had already been a dominant part of what we were doing. Again, just doubled down, went all in on memberships. And it was about two years ago, two years ago this week, actually. I don't know why I'm saying it was about. We are celebrating our two-year anniversary of Membersite Academy, which uh, you know we've, we've been doing exclusively for the best part of those two years. Uh, mm. You know, we moved away from client work completely. And now this is it. This is what we do. Uh, we've been running the academy for two years. We've got over a thousand members and it's all going great. Well, congratulations on two year anniversary. That's pretty exciting. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So you said something earlier about um, building communities around the games that you mm. were kind of writing as a hobby in. And did that, shed some light or did, did you sort of reflect back on that later on and realize how important community was to membership sites? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, my kind of my, my baptism of fire into uh, internet usage was largely with message boards, news boards, online forums and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, the, the whole building my own communities around, around the games I was interested in and stuff like that, uh, I took, you know, I didn't immediately connect the dots because, again, it, uh, a video gaming community is a whole other beast from a, you know, a business community. Mm. Like, it's, so I think beast is probably the right kind of word to describe <laughs> the, the characteristics of the kind of communities that I had back in the day. But, yeah, you know, it was, um, uh, it, it was just one of those things when I was just kind of, thinking back on uh, on those early days of, of online activity and realizing just how much without realizing it, um, I, I was entrenched in the the notion of just using online communities to bring people together. That sounds quite cheesy, but um, you know I think I, I think it's the most underrated part of membership businesses today. Mm. And I think, you know, with most membership sites in the context that you know, we're talking membership sites, which are mainly e-learning. There's so much focus on content and bells and whistles and features. How many courses do you have? Um, how many downloads are available to members and this, that, and the other. And, you know, people will come to a membership for the content, but they'll stay for the community. The community that's, is the glue that keeps people around. That's exactly right, yeah. And, I, yeah, when I first started playing in this area, um, I read a statistic and I thought, that's amazing. It's something like um, 13, 12 or 13 percent is the industry standard, or was at the time when I read this, might have been a year or two ago, um, was the industry standard for completion rates of online mm. courses. And, yeah. you know, that was the benchmark. And people like Seth Godin, um, who, you know, his content is awesome, he was getting that sort of level. So, Ordinary people, <laughs> yeah. put Seth out of ordinary, but the ordinary people were well below that. And I thought, that's incredible. How can it be that low? But then, you know, if you think about it, a lot of people, it's easy to sign up to an e-learning course if it's not hugely expensive, but then mm. you kind of park it, put it away, and that's what 90% of people do. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, in, in some ways that's where the membership model uh, is is great for the content side of things because you have that recurring subscription with most memberships that does light a little bit of a fire under your backside mm. and motivate you to actually use what you're paying for. Yeah. And similarly, as a membership site owner, that, that puts the onus on you to actually create something that is worth paying for and that is worth consuming and completing and so on. But, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to the, the difference between what people want and what people need. <laughs> and, you know, people will sign up for what, for what they want, which is typically the the courses and the content, and they'll they'll be drawn in by um, you know the, the the deliverables and all that sort of stuff. But what they usually need is just 
to to be around like-minded people, to be around people who've been in the same place they are, who are maybe further on their journey, to have that accountability, develop that network, and so on. So yeah, it's it's something you see quite often. You know, people will come in and their first few weeks in the membership, they'll just be consuming content, and then you kind of see it. You know, we we obviously we we can monitor and review all of our members' activity. You'll see it where just one day they pop in the community and then all of a sudden things start to shift mm. and they're in there all of the time and the actual content consumption takes a back seat. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great for membership owners or community leaders because you can deliver so much value to so many people just by showing up in a community and answering their questions or, you know, helping them along their way. Yeah, yeah, and that's fantastic advice. I mean, there's so much there that that I think is is really important for people to remember when they um, get involved in membership sites and online learning. Mm-hmm. So, um, just taking a step back, then why why would anybody set up a membership site? Oh, good question. Mm-hmm. Why would you want to set up a membership? <laughs> we we love memberships for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, uh, we very much center everything we do around this uh, around being completely clear that memberships aren't for everyone memberships involve work it's not a set it and forget it kind of thing if you want people to pay you on an ongoing value uh, sorry if you want people to pay you on an ongoing basis you need to deliver value on an ongoing Mm. basis and so you know that means you need to want to be showing up you need to want to create content want to be in your community and some people don't want that some people don't uh, have the, the right kind of situation to allow them to do that. It's also a slow burn. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're not going to become a multimillionaire overnight, despite what the, the latest internet marketing shyster with a $2,000 <laughs> course selling has to tell you. You know, memberships are not a quick path to riches. So anyone looking for a silver bullet or a golden goose or – Anyone with visions of kicking back on a beach, sipping more hitos as the money rolls in, this notion of passive income, which tends to get associated with memberships, it's it's just not true. You know, nobody uh, works four hours a week. Nobody has that kind of lifestyle. Not even the guy who wrote the four-hour work week. So if you're coming to memberships for those kind of things, you're probably better off looking at a different model. But if you have an audience that you want to serve, if you want to serve more of them and make more of an impact, uh, if you want to move away from trading time for money in terms of working with clients, in terms of um, you know being in the service industry, if you want to get away from one-to-one business and move to one-to-many, memberships are one of the best models for doing that. And the recurring revenue that comes from a membership gives your business a stability a scalability and a predictability that is pretty much unprecedented compared to most of the types of business models. You don't get those peaks and troughs that you get with launching courses or launching new products or you know dealing with these big money clients where maybe you've got four or five big clients on the roster and if one of them decides that they are going to change their payment terms from 30 days to 60 days, well, you're eating ramen noodles for the next <laughs> month. <Yeah. laughs> All of that goes out the window with the membership. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I just love being in there. I just love mixing up with our members, watching their stories over a long-term basis. You know, we've got people who've been with us for the whole two years that we've been open. And you see that evolution and you know you played a part in it. And it's, it's amazingly fulfilling um, as, a, as a business owner to be able to have that reach and that impact and to see this stuff happening in your community. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really um, a great explanation of all the benefits of of having a membership site, and I love I love what you said about it. it's not the silver bullet. So the guy that's um, yeah. standing in front of the expensive car and yacht and <laughs> that is, selling that is something. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's I, right. Yeah. You know, this this is taking a little it bit. Might not even it. might not even be real. It might just be a yeah. photo backdrop. Well, we um, there was, there was a guy, you know, that kind of thing, and this isn't to offend our. our transatlantic cousins but that kind of thing is a little more inherently american uh, in terms of marketing style in terms of the boldness of it 
Mm. Uh, it's not really something you typically see from UK marketers. And so when a UK marketer popped up doing that kind of thing last year, uh, no, sorry, it was two or three years ago, um, there were a few people in, in kind of my network were were kind of taken back and were like, okay, let's let's look into this. And they actually found on Google Maps the stately home that he was stood in front of and it was a hotel and you know one of them one of them like mega zoomed in on on the image and you could kind of see the rental sticker on the car and it's just it's nonsense i hate that kind of stuff and you know i've been around the scene for the better part of two decades now and it, it, it still sickens me how, how how people are seduced by it I understand how you know why they are, but the whole snake oil, get rich overnight with zero work and all that mm. sort of stuff. It's 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 shocking. And don't get me wrong, you can build a very profitable business around a membership, but it is a business. It's not a get rich quick gimmick. It's not right. yeah. a turnkey kind of thing. It's it's just a business model. Mm. And so yeah, we we are very careful to make sure that we actually present that accurately. Hmm. And, you know, it sounds like you're very authentic about that. And I always look at those kind of advertisements that we've kind of been laughing over and, and think, well, you know, that there's just something not authentic about all of that. Yeah. And, you know, the kind of adage that it's if it's too good to be true, then it's probably not true. So. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's seductive. It's seductive and hmm. it's a shame. It really is. So what are the key things then if somebody wants to get started with a membership site and, and you've pointed out that, you know, you have to provide really good value for to get members on board and have to continue to provide that good value to um, have the recurring membership, um, how would you suggest people get started and get organised before they get underway? Yeah, I think the first thing is getting the mindset right. So all the stuff that we just talked about there, understanding what is actually involved in a membership and, you know, really figuring out whether this is for you. You know, is it something you see yourself doing in five years, 10 years, 15 years? Membership or the long game? You need to want to do this. So if the idea of creating content, if the idea of answering questions from your community, if that sounds like your idea of hell, then <laughs> membership's just on for you. Um, the second thing you need to do really is uh, you need to build your audience. You need to build your following first. A lot of people try to build the mountain and then get people to come to it. It's the whole field of dreams, build it and they will come kind <laughs> yeah, of yeah. thing. And it's not a valid business model. You know, Kevin Bacon, uh, Kevin, it's not even Kevin Bacon. Kevin Costner has a lot to answer for. I'm sure Kevin Bacon yeah. has a lot to answer for too. But that, that, that film, um, you see that mindset throughout online marketers and people saying up memberships. You can't take that approach. Build your audience first, and they will help you determine, you know, what you should be creating, you know, whether a membership is right for their needs, whether it's the best way of solving their problems. And, you know, so, yeah, build that audience. And before jumping into um, choosing membership plugins and systems or trying to figure out how many courses you should have and all that sort of stuff, validate 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 your idea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. put something out there that actually proves that people are willing to pay money for a solution that you want to offer them so many people skip this initial stage of researching and validating their idea and i understand because they get excited they get this golden nugget the best idea for a membership site that anyone has ever had in all eternity and they rush headfirst into making it happen they buy the membership plugins they sign up for all of these marketing services they go with the real expensive email marketing platform they buy a developer and they do all this they spend months sinking their time and money into this and then they open their doors and it's crickets yeah it's crickets riding on the back of tumbleweeds blowing forever through the eternal desert of despair because at no point did they ever ask anybody, do you want this? Mm. So you must, you must, you must validate your idea. I've seen so many people go down the wrong path through not doing that. Yeah, and I would say that three most important things to do before you get into technology, creating content, anything like that. Get the mindset right. 
make sure you understand what you're getting into. Build your audience first, research and validate your idea. Yeah, great advice. And, you know, in, in terms of validating the idea, it's, I mean, this is not unique to membership sites. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, people, people often spend in order amounts of money and time developing an idea into a product uh, before they test it in the marketplace. And, yeah. and then, you then know, they, the, mm. yeah, the worst time to find out that your idea was never good to begin with is at your product launch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not the way you want to go. So how do you go about building an audience then if you're just starting out? Um, I mean, there's there's various ways of doing it for us, and I think especially you know tapping into um, you know the internet and the online world. I think content marketing is one of the best ways of, of building up an audience. I think especially with a membership where you know a lot of memberships are centered around an expert or someone giving credible expertise or guidance or instruction. And, you know, one of the best ways of demonstrating that expertise and building an audience around it is putting out good content through a blog, through a podcast, especially we find, we, you know, we find for us our podcast is great for letting people get to know our voice and our personalities a little bit. Mm. And that makes them more likely to, um, to stick around longer because they already know what we're about before they join our membership, they've already got a connection with us. That is a little harder to get through uh, through blogs. Uh, Facebook Live at the minute is hot. Doing a Facebook Live and then putting that up on YouTube and taking the audio and putting it out as a podcast, you know, all that sort of stuff. Get that content going. Get that expertise built and build your email list around it. It's not about Twitter followers. It's not about Facebook fans. Get people on an email list and market to them hmm. you know? and don't go all out sell 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 and you know <laughs> be all about um trying to squeeze money out of them but also don't go in the other direction of thinking that you know if if you have a product to sell or if you are developing an idea for a membership that you can't ask your list about it because you don't want to be that marketing person to put people off build a list of valid interested people you know don't run one of these you know contests to win an iPad just so you get 50,000 people on your list who mm. have no interest in, in the topic. Build your list on the back of expertise content and uh, you know you can do a lot with a highly targeted list that's relatively modest in size compared to you know some of what you see uh, you know, people talking about out there. Yeah. Yeah, great advice. And and you know that I mean that strategy has been working for you know, at least, well, since the internet was started because yeah. I remember setting up a, a, an authority website, we called it at the time in 1997, that's still running today and still ranking as the number one site for that particular niche uh, based on a content marketing strategy, basically. Yeah. Um, but also, um, you mentioned podcasts. So did you start the podcast when you started the membership guys? We did, yeah. I mean, with us, it's funny. When we've been doing um, the agency and when we've been focusing money on client stuff, every now and then we put a blog out. Um, that was usually just because we had something we wanted to say and the only way of venting that was to hammer into WordPress whatever our thoughts were and just get it out there. It was never done as part of a content marketing strategy because all of our client work came from word of mouth and we worked with a very small group of uh, select clients on a real integrated hands-on basis. So mm. we, weren't, we weren't actively putting out content until we decided that we were going to set up the academy, we were going to plant our flag as the membership guys and – we started the blog, we started a podcast, we started a YouTube channel, all at the same time. The podcast was a little bit more of a vanity project. I've done uh, online radio. I founded a, an online radio station back in 2005, co-founded, sorry, uh, back in 2005. So, you know, I've always had a thing about sitting behind a mic and just talking, as you may be able to tell. <laughs> and uh, so it was just kind of the natural thing to do i've been involved in a few uh, a few of other people's podcasts before um but we never quite anticipated just how key the podcast would be until we very first opened the doors to the academy which was three months after we started the podcast and the blog 
and we found consistently of the people who we kind of already knew from, we had a Facebook group and from our email list or people who had emailed us before, um, those guys we knew, but from the people we didn't know who were totally fresh to our audience, more consistently than any other channel, they were telling us they found us through the podcast. Yeah. So that added discoverability um, from that podcast that lets you tap into an audience you otherwise wouldn't be able to reach, that very quickly became a critical part of what we do. And even to this day, and uh, you know, if, if there was one marketing channel we had to keep going, if there was no other marketing we could do, I'd keep the podcast. Mm. We just launched a second podcast now as well, uh, just to kind of double down on that. And also because I, I wouldn't let Callie on my podcast. <laughs> it was my show. Uh, and the, the three times I had her on as a guest, the the download numbers were like the best that we had. So there's a little bit of an ego play. But the problem is <laughs> so, her, her brand new podcast, day one, got in the top 10 um, of the, the, the business marketing uh, category on iTunes. She's up there. She's beating the likes of Amy Porterfield and John Lee Dumas and, and all of that. And yeah, her show is very, very good. So maybe... Maybe my ego has kind of <laughs> a check I can't cash because she's kind of whooping my butt now on the podcast front. Oh, so, okay. So what's what's Carly's uh, podcast? Because I don't think I've come across that. I've listened to yours. Yeah, it's it's brand new. It's called Behind the Membership, and you know while my show is very much based around primarily um, tips and advice or practical advice for membership owners, with the occasional expert interview. Uh, mm-hmm. thrown in when it's the right subject and the right person. Yeah. Um, hers is conversations with everyday membership site owners. Oh, so okay. people you people you may have heard of who are, who are you know they have a bit of um, a, a, a bit of a name in their their particular uh, niche, but they're not the usual suspects that you see on most of the people's podcasts. They're kind of the unsung heroes in in business and. It's, it's pretty much a, a what and all um, kind of thing. It's it's not just looking for people who have real successful memberships. It's looking for people where they launched a membership and maybe it failed mm. or maybe it took them a year to get any traction. Or, you know, I know one of the first episodes released uh, was actually a guy where he had to basically just start again. His first membership flopped. He went back to the drawing board, relaunched it completely different, repackaged. And so that conversation is very much about, you know, the, the ins, outs, ups and downs of all of that. And, uh, yeah, it's, it makes for real interesting listening. Mm. And, uh, yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's proven very popular. Well, I'll go find that and we'll add that to the links under the show notes of, awesome. of this episode, yeah. And I'll uh, go have a listen and boost our numbers a little bit more. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm already boosting yours. So that's <laughs> <laughs> I get surprised by that because, you know, my topic, uh, you know, the topic of memberships, it's not an emotional or an entertaining topic. It's a very functional mm. subject. And, you know, on the rare occasion, I pull out the soapbox and I get a little heated in my opinions. But for the most part, you know, Deciding whether to use a Facebook group or forum software for your membership, it's not something that's going to get people on their feet. But I'm always surprised by, you know, the amount of people where they'll, they'll kind of tell me that I've just done a cross-country um, drive from one side of the U.S. to the other, and I binge listen to your podcast all the way. And I, I love my show, but I'm kind of like, do you not get bored? Like, <laughs> it's not, it's, it's yeah. not like it's like serial or something yeah. like that way. You know, it's it's yeah. like can't wait for the next real. episode because I really yeah. want to find out what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I really can't wait to to find yeah. out Mike's opinions on on you know what tools you should use for member onboarding. Yeah. It's like, but, yeah, but, but having, I, I yeah. That. having said that, though, I mean, I you know, kudos to you because I I find it very entertaining as well as informative, and oh, thank you. you know, for an audience um, that is interested in doing membership websites or maybe is doing membership websites and thinks, you know, I can learn more and maybe I can improve some things. I think it's, it's really valuable. Thank you. Thank mm. you. All right. So you, you talked about content and using content as marketing. So what are some of the key things to keep in mind when you do 
go into content marketing to kind of build that audience and lay the groundwork for um, one one of the three key pillars of the membership site. Yeah, I mean, everything needs to connect. Uh, the biggest mistake I see people make is they treat their, their content marketing, their blog as this thing all the way out on one side of the picture mm. and then their membership as this thing completely on the other side and then they get all wrapped up in trying to connect the two up. Like how do we how do we take someone who read this blog post about this one thing and get them to join the membership? You need to view it as all part of the same thing. So every piece of content that you put out there should connect directly back to some aspect of your membership. Your audience should be able to connect the dots between blog post to lead magnet, lead magnet to the emails you send them once they opt in, those emails directly to something in your membership. So, you know, there's various ways in which you can do this, and a lot of it does depend on how your membership is structured. Sometimes it's a lot. Sometimes it's, it's, that's just an organic thing. You know, I know memberships that have sprung up where essentially the main offering is some bonus content to the free content. So as an example, music websites where perhaps they are backing tracks or they are, um, you know, sheet music or something like that, that are related to a free lesson that's been put out there. That sort of stuff is very easy to connect. Um, but, you know, if you've got a membership where you've got a course with 20 lessons, take two or three of those lessons and put them out there for free. That makes joining the membership a very organic call to action it's easy for people to understand the link between your free content and your paid content. You're not trying to, you know, take two unrelated, unconnected worlds. You're working with a strategy where every single thing you put out there for free directly connects to a lesson, to a workshop, to a course, to a challenge, to a, a worksheet, to something that is a natural next step. If someone reads your blog article and thinks, this is great, what do I do next? Um, that, I think, is the key between connecting your free content and your paid content. And then surrounding that, you know, I think really tapping into things like social proof that comes from the fact that you will have a community of hundreds or even thousands of people use what those guys are telling you. If you do a podcast, like with, with ours, our, our kind of intention with the podcast is to make every episode the answer to a question, a specific question. So, um, you know, should I offer a free trial? That becomes a podcast. It started as a question that someone asks in a Facebook group or in the member community. You take that, you make that the premise for, for your podcast. But, in the setup for that podcast or that blog post or that video, you say, this is a question that was asked by one of the members over at Member Side Academy. Should you do this? So you're just weaving in the fact that you have your membership into the mm -hmm. stuff you're putting out there. You know, some people bring members onto their show. We talked about Cali Show just there behind the membership. All three of the people on the, the three episodes released so far, they're all Academy members. Now, they're not on the show to shill the Academy, but the Academy comes up once or twice just because it is the world that they are in, and so it's natural and organic to talk about it. Um, you know, some people do coaching calls. They coach members from their, their membership on podcasts, and they put that podcast out there to the public. And again, lots of organic opportunities uh, for the membership to be mentioned, which means you don't have to cram in sales pitches. So that would kind of be my two core pieces of advice. Have a, a unified strategy for your free content that directly relates to your paid content. If you're adding a new course, if you're bringing out something new in your membership, your free content should reflect that. Everything should connect back. And then two, look for organic ways to feature members to bring out social proof from your paid community and integrate that into your free content. Yeah, that's that's all great advice. And it, you know, when you see this in action, it makes so much sense because it all mm. links together and then it's easy to build additional content on the end of that because if you've kind of built a chain of uh, links together and then you can kind of expand yeah. on one particular topic and, you know, the whole thing kind of has yeah. an organic kind of growth of its own almost. Yeah. 
And the thing is, you know, one of the most challenging parts about memberships is that memberships are quite hard to sell as a concept because they're usually all encompassing. So if you're selling a course, you can say very specifically, here's the title of the course, these are the specific lessons, these are the specific outcomes. If you're selling a membership that, you know, Membersite Academy, for example, we've got like 30 or 40 courses. It's harder to be specific with what you get when you join the academy when you've got 30 or 40 courses because you're not going to break each and every one of those down. You're just going to list out the titles Mm. and there's some other stuff. So when you have that single all-encompassing product, it can be challenging uh, communicating the value without getting too vague and too broad or just sounding like it's a kitchen sink kind of thing. So, you know, that whole strategy of, of really zeroing in and making sure every piece of free content you put out there ties back to a bit of paid content, that enables you to shine the spotlight on one specific part of your membership and use that as a selling point. So if I write a, a um, blog article about how to build an audience for your membership site, my call to action on that isn't just go and join the academy to learn more. Mm. It is, by the way, we just added a brand new course in the membership which shows you how to build an audience and these are the lessons it has and these are the outcomes. So you're only promoting that one specific part, but your promotion of that part of the membership is hyper relevant because it is shown in the context of a blog article about that very thing. So you need to always be looking for opportunities to just organically connect the dots for your users and your Mm. audience. Yeah, and also as what you were saying earlier, as you build um, new content or new courses, that's a great way to test them as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. You know, if you if if you do a little podcast series and no one listens to it, um, you know, the the worst downloaded episodes, then <laughs> maybe that slips down the priority list. And yeah, it's a, if you've got two or three ideas for what to create next for your membership, do three or four blog posts in a row on those and just see, you know, which gets the best traction, which gets the most feedback. Mm. All right. Now, you mentioned something about, uh, well, you sort of talked pricing and value a few times during our discussion so far. So I want to get on to pricing. So how do you determine what price to charge if you've built this fabulous um, membership website and you've got a great community and people are really interested? How do you go about setting the right price? You know, pricing is one of those things that should be straightforward. But it really isn't because very little about pricing is based in logic. Yeah. You know, most decisions about what to buy, they are emotional. They are swayed by, um, you know, subconscious factors as opposed to a logical uh, decision. And so, you know, when it comes to setting your, your membership price, a lot of it comes down to gut. In all honesty, uh, you need to think about things like how much direct one-on-one you're offering. You know, the more someone gets private direct one-on-one access to you, the higher a premium you can command. Um, Is it done for you? Is it done with you? Or is it do it yourself? The more facilitation you offer, the higher premium you can command. How exclusive are you? So all of these sorts of things, you need to kind of weigh these factors up. Um, And, you know, that should give you a good idea and a good impression, especially if you're comparing with alternative solutions on the market. But a lot of it is is just good. What do you feel your market will bear in terms of in, in terms of price point? Uh, how will your price point sit in comparison to alternative solutions? So you know if you're teaching something where the only possible other way someone could learn it is by paying ten grand a month for a private tutor, mm. and you can probably charge a little more for it just based on on what else is on the market compared to if you're teaching Facebook marketing yeah. where everybody has something. There's millions of courses on Udemy. There's a bunch of different memberships. So all these kind of things come into it. This is all to kind of say that it's a how long is this piece of string question. <laughs> and I know that's a frustrating answer yeah. and I'm learning over the years that while it's the most accurate answer that can be given, people hate it. So as a rule of thumb, business to business memberships will typically be priced at around about 30 to $70 a month. Business to consumer will typically be priced a bit less because they're viewed in a very different way. You know, your, mm. 
you're an expense if you're a B2C membership. You know, you're compared to cell phone bills, grocery bills, and all that sort of stuff. So typically, you're looking at around about fifteen to thirty-five dollars, forty dollars at a push. The big uh, exception to that in B2C memberships are topics where there's a financial barrier to entry. So things like photography or things like music instruction, where yes, it's B2C, yes, it's a hobby, but in order to even engage in that hobby, someone has had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they understand that being interested in photography and learning about it is something that you pay and you you invest in. Same with music instruction. Mm. So it is very much a confluence of lots of different factors and lots of illogical stuff and researching your market and knowing your audience and all that sort of stuff. But as a rule of thumb, those kind of price ranges we talked about is what you typically see in, in most markets. There's always outliers. You know, you'll still see people set up memberships where they're charging like five dollars for an entire year and you're kind <laughs> of thinking, Yeah, you're gonna regret yeah. that. Yeah, when you see how much work's involved, but, you know. Yeah, and also what are they saying about the value? <laughs> exactly, exactly, and that's the thing. It's about value. The thing with most memberships is the operating costs are minimal. Like, they are a high-margin business, as with most things online. You don't typically have too much in terms of, um, you know, scaling expenses. Usually what you're paying out on a month-to-month basis for a membership with 100 members won't go up too much if you reach a thousand, two thousand, five thousand, what have you. Um, you can get to quite a profitable or quite a high turnover without really pushing your expenses up. And so that kind of means that you know, with if you're selling products, usually it's margin based. You know, these are all the costs of what goes into this, and this is what it will sell for based on the twenty percent profit margin. Hmm. You don't typically think that with memberships because there's so much margin in it, and you re- you very rarely get a per unit cost. If you're doing Facebook ads, for example, or you're doing any form of advertising, you know, after your first year of running a membership, you'll have a better picture of your cost of acquisition for each member. So if you're especially if you're spending on advertising, you'll have an idea of roughly how much you are spending per member to get them to sign up. Um, so at a minimum, you want to make sure your, your monthly payment covers that. And you see a lot of memberships where actually maybe, maybe it's $30 of ad spend to bring in a member. And so they'll charge $30 a month. So that first month's payment covers the cost of acquisition. And then every month after that is, is gravy, you know, it's profit. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you have a lot of room to play with in terms of pricing, usually yeah. with most memberships. And in terms, I mean, one of the, th- the concerns then once you've got the membership site up and running and you've got members signing up is churn, right? So mm, if you're looking yeah. at, at the performance of the site and what you're putting into it and the value that you're delivering, had, so what are some tips you could give to address churn, which, you know, I don't know if that's a common term, but to me it means... yeah members leaving because they don't see the value or they feel neglected or they don't feel loved or whatever it might be. I mean, there's probably hundreds of reasons why they'll leave. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing that trips a lot of people up who are new to memberships. They, they don't think of that because in most uh, businesses you are focused purely on getting the sale and with a membership, it's more about keeping that member. So you need that good balance between getting new members and retaining them. It's no good bringing people in through the front door if they're just going to leave out the back. So yeah. you need to make sure you're hanging on to them. Uh, it typically costs more to bring in a new member than it does to retain an existing one. So, you know, first and foremost, you just need to embrace that getting the sale. That's not the end goal. That's not the finish line. It's a starting pistol. Hmm. Your work when you bring in a new member is just beginning. Once you got that first monthly payment, you need to think about how you're going to get that second one, that third one, that 36th one. So you need a solid retention strategy. And I'd say there's four main things when it comes to uh, member retention. One, you need to get your onboarding right. Mm -hmm. Member retention starts day one, minute one. The second someone joins your site, the clock 
is ticking. So you need to ensure that all of your members get off to the right start, that they're building the sort of habits that are going to keep them subscribed long term. Second, you need to provide value. I mentioned this before. If you want people to pay on an ongoing basis, you've got to deliver value on an ongoing basis. That doesn't mean just throwing more content at them. It means showing up, serving your community, constantly trying to innovate in order to solve your members' problems and helping them to get the results they join your site to achieve. You know, No one joins a membership to stand still. They join because they want to get somewhere. They want an outcome. They want a result. They want to hit a goal. It's your role to get them there. And through what you do, the content you provide, the community interaction, that's where the value comes if you're helping people get results. So get your onboarding right. Provide value. Number three, community. Again, talked about before, members come for the content. They'll save for the community. That's doubly true of memberships. Having a community element like a discussion forum or a Facebook group gives your membership that stickability factor that keeps people hooked and subscribed long beyond the point when they're done with your content. And four, you need to implement a dunning process. So dunning is basically the process, for anyone who's not heard of that term, it's a process of handling failed subscription payments. You know, you'll find, you mentioned uh, before, you know, people will cancel for all sorts of reasons. You'll find a high percentage of people who fail out of your membership do so because of billing issues, expired cards, failed payments, and all that sort of stuff. So there's various things that you can't do much about in terms of when someone decides to leave a membership. Cancellations are part and parcel of running a membership site. Churn is part and parcel of running a membership site. But there's things like this, failed payments, that you can do something about. So Mm -hmm. make sure you've got a robust and ideally automated way of handling failed payments. Some membership systems have this built in. MemberPress, for example, it's a plugin for WordPress that we use for our old membership. It automatically notifies people if their credit card's cancelling. It automatically follows up and chases them if their payment has failed. But then there's other services out there like Metrics, ProfitWell, Stunning.co. They have Dunning features as well that will automatically, um, you know, do a variety of different tasks to reduce the chance of failed payments. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's great advice, and I wouldn't have thought of that last one actually. Um, so that's uh, one to add to my list. Um, <laughs> but yeah, definitely, um, you know, the onboarding, providing ongoing value. I love that. You know, showing up, serving the community, being innovative, and making sure that you actually help them achieve their goals. And then yeah. You can, Building and, that community you know, and the dunning. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I would say probably that one of the biggest mistakes people make with retention is, uh, you know, we talked about stopping people cancelling or reducing the chance of people cancelling. Some people treat that with hostility. They go on the offensive against it. And so they think that if they make it difficult for people to cancel, then they'll stick around. Hmm. And as you said, cancellations are part and parcel of running a membership site. You can't take them personally. You can't treat them with hostility, and you can't always assume people are leaving because they're unhappy. People leave for a variety of reasons. Maybe things are just tight for them financially right now, so they need to take a break to get sorted. Maybe there's a family crisis or there's a national emergency. You know, there's <laughs> a lot of a lot of stuff going on, and you know, your membership is not going to be top of the list of priorities. Exactly. They right. may be just yeah, they maybe just don't have room in their life to use the membership or maybe maybe they've achieved what they've set out to achieve when they joined your site. Hmm. You know, in a lot of those cases, there's every chance that members will come back further down the line, but that's not going to happen if you burn your bridges by making them jump through hoops and treating them poorly when they try to cancel. Yeah, make that's... the decision. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, make the decision to cancel difficult, not the process. I would say about 23 to 24% of everyone who leaves our site comes back within six months. Hmm. That would not happen if we made them jump through hoops and punish them for cancelling. Hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. And I, you know, I see that in so many, um, so many things, that philosophy, like, it, you know, you see a lot of the pop-up um, forms where people um, have a lead magnet and they have a pop-up come up and, they make it very difficult to actually exit that pop-up because yeah. the, the exit button is hidden or really small. Yeah. Or, and I think, yeah. why do you make it so difficult? Because you're or, just pissing me off, right? Yeah. <laughs> or the other, the, the trend from the past few years, and I think it was, uh, I think it was like Noah Kagan possibly popularized this one, um, where 
they'll kind of say, do you want this thing? Yes, I want to be the best person in the world. No, I hate you. I hate my life. And <laughs> yeah. I hate my family and I'm not willing. Like they try, they, they think that that works and it probably yeah. does. But, you know, they, they hmm. make you click on an option which is basically say, I'm a terrible person for not wanting your, your free ebook. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, well, I just did a, a video before, as I mentioned to you, at the start before we started recording and um, it was in regards to a new lead magnet I'm putting up and and the video is kind of the greeting after people sign up and the first thing I say is um, I want you to unsubscribe from my list straight away because <laughs> the last the last thing I want to do is clutter up your inbox you know I get mine cluttered up by all kinds of people sending me useless stuff and I don't want to be the person sending you useless stuff so if you're not 120% convinced right now that I'm going to be sending you exceptionally useful information that's of help to you, then please unsubscribe straight away. Yeah. And so I yeah. figured, I figured, you know, some a lot of people might take up that invitation, and that's perfectly yeah. okay because they're the ones, like you say in the membership example, they're the ones that you know when they see me do other stuff sometime later, they'll say, well, he's the guy that um, didn't want to clutter up my inbox, so I might come back and have a look what he's got yeah. now. And and you know what? You probably won't get anyone unsubscribing. If anything, it'll probably make them more likely to stick around because they'll know that if they do stick around, you're going to treat that permission they've just given you mm. with more respect. You know, that, because you, you you're coming at it from from the right approach. And you know, it's it's funny. I th- I think thankfully we're starting to see a shift away from from the numbers game in terms of uh, just trying to get anybody on your email list at all costs. I think. That shift has been largely driven by more and more email providers charging you per subscriber. <laughs> that's right, yeah. It's yeah literally, it's like <laughs> it's people figuring out that, hold on, like only like 0.3% of our list converts. We've got 200,000 people on it. That's got <laughs> fortune. Um, I, we had a client years back who we brought close to tears when we told him we were going to delete 80,000 people from his email list, even though these were people who hadn't opened an email in 18 months. Hmm. But he was so attached and it was so entrenched in this thing that's been promoted for years about how, you know, growing your list as big as possible yeah. that, uh, you know, the fact that those 80,000 people were doubling his uh, his bill for his email provider, that wasn't as important as being able to log in and see that he had like 100 odd thousand on his list. It's yeah, that's right. It's it's one of those vanity metrics, uh, vanity, yeah, vanity sure. metrics, isn't it? Where so, gee, I've got eighty thousand or a hundred thousand people on my list, but yeah. you know, only two thousand of them actually engage <laughs> with me and care what I'm doing. The other ninety-eight thousand couldn't care less. Yeah, it's yeah. that's crazy, crazy. Mm. All right, this is fascinating, Mike. I really appreciate this, and and I could probably go on and ask a lot more questions, but I think <laughs> respecting your time, at the time we move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and that's designed to help our audience, who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field, but help them with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions that I always ask, and hopefully you'll give us some insightful answers that will inspire everyone to go and do something awesome. Let's do it. Yeah, great. So what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Uh, You need to actively engage with your audience and encourage and embrace their feedback. So many people see feedback and see comments and emails as a negative or something to be minimized. Encourage and embrace this stuff. As an entrepreneur, your one role is to solve problems. That's it. doesn't matter what title you call yourself in your business card or your website or anything. You're not that. You are a problem solver. Each and every one of us is in the business of solving problems. And you can't provide a solution until you understand the problem. The only way to do that is to listen to your audience. So it's not a particularly sexy answer, I don't think, but find ways to continuously and actively engage with your audience and act on the feedback they give you because those guys will point you in the right direction most of the time. Well, I think it's a great answer because, uh, you know, and it, it's consistent with what we were saying earlier about the magic bullet kind mm. of approach that, you know, you actually have to put in a little bit of work. Now, there's nothing really difficult about talking to your audience and engaging them and taking feedback on board and maybe asking a bunch of questions to clarify things and get a better understanding. And it's amazing what that will do for you. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, those guys will be a bottomless pit of ideas and inspiration. And, you know, yes, you will get some people who are annoying and you will get, <laughs> you know, you will get to a point where when you've answered the the same question, like for the 56th time and all that sort of stuff, but, you know, it's part and parcel of doing business. For the most part, these guys are going to fuel ideas and innovation and product development and content for as long as you'll listen to them. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? I would probably say our Facebook group. Again, very, very it's simple. But when yeah. we yeah, when we decided that uh, we knew we were going to set up the academy, but we also knew that we couldn't just stop what we were doing and just be doing that. So, you know, as we were bringing everything together, we set up a Facebook group just so we had somewhere to send our audience and somewhere to engage with them, listen to them and stuff like that. And I would say that the interactions in there have probably fueled most of the uh, ideas or the prioritization of our free content, our paid content. It's given us new ideas that we wouldn't have thought of in terms of uh, what to add into the membership, and it continues to, to do so. And it's got all sorts of other benefits from a marketing point of view as well. Mm, yeah, great advice. And, and also... Yeah, you know, it's part of building that community, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Mm. What's your favorite tool or system for improving your productivity and allowing you to be more innovative? Asana. Mm-hmm. I, I up until <laughs> up until this year, like I'm a, a curmudgeon, even though I'm like massively techy. You know, we do the sales, we do the marketing, all that sort of stuff. The root of it, the foundation of where that all started, was building websites, programming, coding, yeah, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. But I, I have that um, contrary thing where, like, for the last, like, seven or eight years, my to-do list and my project management has been a single Google Doc that every six months I would just update the date of and the title. So I was just <laughs> to, to-do list. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd be in kind of February 2015, and I'd be working from a document which is like, to-do list, January 3rd, 2014. Um and yeah, I was kind of forced into switching over to Asana um, by Kali, my other half. She's a bit more organized <laughs> and a bit more pragmatic than I am. And I love it. It kind of runs our life and our business, especially now we're expanding the team. Um, it's it's critical to what yeah. we do. Yeah. Yeah, I've been an Asana user for quite a long time and I sort of got a love hate relationship with it, but but yeah. you know, it's still for our purposes, it's still the best out there. And they have been doing quite a bit of work on it recently and upgraded. And just recently, they've done a, a big update that's improved the speed quite dramatically as well, which is useful. Yeah, I've noticed that. Hmm. Very cool. All right. What's the best way to keep a project or a client on track? Um, again, kind of Asana and using their, their templating um, system for us is, is, is good. It's not as robust as it could be you know but we worked around it um in terms of keeping things on track you know we obviously we don't work with clients now when mm. we essentially just have one mammoth project uh but we we kind of <laughs> almost developed our own hybrid customized version of a combination of kanban and the eisenhower decision matrix just one for people to look at with the door away. We've yeah. kind of developed that as our um, means of prioritizing and deciding what stuff to work on in our project and to keeping us focused on you know on, on the tasks at hand and also to you know dividing responsibilities. So we've kind of we 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 took that offline. We figured that for our regular planning meetings and review meetings, it's better to switch the computers off and just hit the whiteboard where we've got our Kanban, Eisenhower, whatever we want to call it mm. up there. Um, and we pull out the post-its and uh, yeah, that kind of, that informs what we're going to be working on on a quarter quarter basis. Yeah. Yeah. So the Eisenhower decision matrix, is that the important, urgent, not urgent, not important? Yeah, we tweaked that. Yeah. We yeah. tweaked that. We tweaked that based on speed and impact. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, we have fast and high impact, which is obviously no-brainer stuff. If you can do stuff in five yeah, minutes, yeah. that's going to have massive impact. So you have fast and high impact, slow and high impact, uh, fast and low impact. 
and then obviously we just don't have slow and low because <laughs> yes. you shouldn't be doing that stuff. Um, and then yeah, we we bring in the Kanban by like that decision metric stuff is our pipe. We use that for our pipeline, um, so our, our starting point, and then we pull ideas from that and we progress it into to do in progress and then done uh, mm. using kind of the Kanban stuff. Kanban, so it yeah. works really well. Like, mm. It's simple. But I tried all sorts of, uh, you know, we used to, used to kind of do agile development when we were um, working with the, the agency, and it just, it, it just seems like more work goes into um, maintaining the approach to work mm. than goes into the actual work. So yeah, this this works for us. <laughs> mm. Yeah, great advice. I like that. Um, all right, so what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? I think you need to be laser-focused on your niche, or if you're listening in the US, if you insist on saying it this way, niche. Um, <laughs> I have had countless arguments about that. Most of our audience are US-based. Anyway, laser, laser, laser focus on your niche. I see so many people niching down, and then when they start to gain momentum, they go broad they move to the middle, they get more Mm. general, more generic, and they lose focus. So, you know, they'll start out by really carving out a place for themselves as the go-to expert on Facebook or the go-to expert on online courses or memberships. As soon as they start seeing some success, they want to start talking like they're Gary Vaynerchuk. And... (laughs) their content Mm. becomes less and less about the thing that they're known for and more just pontificating about whether or not you should hustle 18 hours a day and it's the same tired, boring old rubbish. You need to laser focus on on your niche. A huge, huge part of our success has been unflinching commitment to our niche. You know, when we very, very first started, we would say, um, you know, tips and advice for memberships and online courses. So an online course is a type of membership, but it's mm. recognized as its own kind of thing. And even just that, even just tightening that up to make it just about memberships, we turn away big name guests for our podcasts if they're not totally on point. We turn down endless opportunities because it would sway just a degree or two away from memberships as a focus. You need to get laser focused and be unflinching in that focus long term if you want to stay the course and differentiate yourself differentiate yourself from everyone else who is just trying to occupy that middle lane hmm. yeah that's great advice and and you know i see that all the time where people they're afraid you know i might miss out on something if i yeah. niche, niche down some more or something and yet you know every time i see it and i've you know recently just actually getting even more focused on my own stuff and the opposite happens, you know, the moment I started focusing more and kind of saying, well, I'm not going to deal with these other clients that are outside of this space, all of a sudden I business started flying in the door that I hadn't really yeah. been marketing for at all, simply because people heard, hey, you're, you're the guy for this now. Yeah, you know, if we, we call ourselves the membership guys for a reason. If someone mm. discovers the membership guys and listens to the membership guys podcast and then all of a sudden I'm just talking about general entrepreneurship yeah. and, you know, it's not in the context of a membership, then I'm letting them down. And, you know, I, I, I've seen this example. I can't remember who I cribbed this from, but I'll I take it and I use it over and over again. But if you've got a rare brain condition, Okay, heaven forbid you don't, but if you diagnosed with this rare brain condition Mm. and you're offered two options of who to treat it, Mm. you've got the guy who each and every day for his entire career has operated on this specific condition. This is all he does. He lives it. He breathes it. He doesn't do anything else. Or you've got the guy who every now and then he'll do a brain. Sometimes he'll do an appendix. This morning he's down in A&E patching up cuts. He, mm. he sometimes does a little bit of nursing. On the side he works at KFC. <laughs> Which yeah. guy do you want? Do you yeah. want the generalist? Do you want the guy mm. who is just broad? Or do you want that one person who is singularly focused 
on solving the problem that you have. Nobody is going to go with that second guy. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's the thing in business. You know, solve a hmm. specific problem, become known for solving that specific problem, and people will come to you with that specific problem rather than going to, again, those middle-of-the-road generic hmm. guys. Hmm. Yeah, great advice. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, so what's the future for you and for membership guys in the Membership Academy? And it's just continue growth of the membership, keep upping the ante in terms of what a membership site can be. You know, we we kind of shine the spotlight on ourselves. If you're going to call yourself the membership guys and the experts on memberships, your membership needs to be in good shape. And so continuous product excellence is is critical to what we do. You know, we're always looking for ways of of really raising the bar on that front. And uh, we've got big plans to make live events a larger part of what we do. You know, um, I've been fortunate to speak at a, a, a bunch of uh, events in the UK, over in the States, and we typically tie workshops or mastermind days into that. We want to take that a little further and probably sometime in the next year or two um, host a larger event of our own uh, somewhere. We haven't mm. decided. It would be more convenient for us to do it in the UK, but most of our audiences are in the US, so that's yeah. that's something on the horizon. Okay, that sounds exciting. You know, um, I, we just uh, ran an event this year. It was a smallish event, but we're looking to grow that one as well. But that was a, a, a retreat. Oh, yeah, it's enormous nice. fun, and it's kind of a natural extension of you know having a, a community that you're serving online to mm. getting them all together in, in real life and then taking them away somewhere. So we went to a tropical resort in Thailand and had... Um, Wow. Yeah, you know, had a lot of fun, but really worked pretty hard. But it was away from the day-to-day -day mundane, you know, everyday issues of the business, so that we could actually really work on the people's business, and that was quite amazing. That sounds awesome. It's definitely the sort of thing we'd like to do. You know, we've uh, we we both really like the idea of you know a multi-day retreat, and uh, yeah, we'd probably need to be somewhere somewhere warm because. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, while there's a lot of very nice places out in the, the middle of nowhere in the UK that uh, that would function well, I I, I think it, it doesn't quite look as uh, <laughs> as attractive on a on an ad or something like that. Yeah. If it's uh, yeah, join us in a field somewhere in the in the rain. Yeah, yeah. Versus <laughs> join us on a tropical <laughs> island. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's more attractive. All right, so what's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner who wants to be a leader in their field and a leader in innovation? Um, again, you know, I, I think it is just about embracing your role as a problem solver, like understanding that people get so swept up in titles. I keep seeing <laughs> oh, the same argument over and over again about whether someone has the right to call themselves an entrepreneur, and people burn a lot of energy and a lot of time debating this. Uh, all that stuff's nonsense. You are a problem solver. That is all you do. Embrace that. Fully understand that. Make that central to everything that you do in your business. And I think that opens up your mindset to get more creative about finding solutions. You know, when you realize everything else is just the trimming to solving a problem. I think that that focuses you in the right area. Um, it incentivizes you to listen to and engage with your audience more than you listen to and engage with people outside of your business. And we all, you know, everybody does that. You're looking at what other kind of big names in your industry are doing. You're looking at what everyone else is talking about on social media instead of talking to your, your community and your audience. Embrace your role as a problem solver that'll focus you on the things that actually matter in your business and that'll drive innovation and that'll drive creativity and ultimately it'll drive success for you and your business. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, be a problem solver, but make sure you really understand the problems you're solving and don't get hung up yeah. on, on distractions. All yeah, right, well, sure. thanks, Mike. This has been really fantastic. Where can people reach out and thank you? Uh, we do all our best stuff over at themembershipguys.com. We've got blog, podcasts, loads of free resources and good stuff. Uh, you can reach out on Twitter if you just want to say hi and let us know that you've listened to 
the show at Membership Guys or come and join us in our free Facebook group. Uh, type in talkmemberships.com, your browser, that will redirect you to our group and uh, join me, Callie, and about 5,000 membership site owners in there as well. And, uh, yeah, be awesome to have you. Fantastic. So I'll post uh, links to all of those places in the show notes as well. And um, finally, who who would you like me to interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? I, uh, it's an interesting one, this. There's a lot, of, a lot of people doing good stuff. Someone I'm really digging at the moment, I'm really liking uh, Luria Petrucci and, uh, and David over at LivestreamingPros.com. They're doing some awesome stuff with Facebook Live video, um, and they are helping a lot of people kind of uh, get into that, that platform. And they're just really cool guys, and they're geeks as well. So, uh, yeah, maybe get see if you can get Luria on the show. Okay, Laurie, well, um, we'll come and get you courtesy of Mike Morrison. <laughs> Mike sent us for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thanks so much, Mike, for sharing your time and your insights with us today. I've really enjoyed this immensely. I've got a whole page of notes here that I need to work <laughs> through and and um, start to bring that into my own work with membership sites. And I've, uh, as I say, I've really enjoyed it. And I, I appreciate you being so generous with your time and your knowledge. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure. I've had a lot of fun on this show. It was great. And I wish you all the best for the future for membership, guys, and let's keep in touch. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Thanks. Well, there was certainly a lot of valuable information and tips in that interview with Mike Morrison. I enjoyed this episode immensely and learned a lot. I hope you did too. I suggest you follow Mike at The Membership Guys and also on his podcast, which is very good. All the great ideas and tips that Mike shared with us can be found at novabiz.com.au forward slash membership guys. That is M-E-M-B-E-R-S-H-I-P-G-U-Y-S. All lowercase, all one word, novabiz.com.au forward slash membership guys. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Mike there. We'd love to hear about your experience in building your community and thoughts on Mike's suggestions in the comments below the blog post. Mike suggested I interview Luria Petrucci from LivestreamPros.com on a future InnovaBuzz podcast. So Luria, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast courtesy of Mike Morrison from The Membership Guys. If you haven't already done so, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the InnovaBuzz podcast so you'll never miss a future episode. Of course, we always welcome feedback and reviews to let us know how we're doing. If there's anything you'd like us to cover or questions you want answered on a future InnovaBuzz podcast or guests you'd like us to interview, please send those ideas to us as well. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Be awesome and keep innovating.